Wow. Thank you very much, George. And hi, everybody. My name's Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Sandy. Okay. I still can't stand, so I'm, I know I can't, you can't see as well as if somebody's standing, but this will have to do for tonight. Doug isn't the only one that's going to entertain you with music tonight. At ha halfway through, I have a song about one of our textbooks. So <laughs> halfway through my talk, I'm going to play the 12 and 12 tango on the Jew's harp. <laughs> and so I think you should get a kick out of that. So I wish I, uh, th that's so great to have that musical talent and just, I bet Bill Wilson played a few songs at meetings with his violin, and yep, I have a he did. Anyway, um, they asked me to um, talk a little bit about God's plan for us, which I don't think I've ever done before. And um, I can't type with this, so I, got, I wrote stuff down and I can barely read my handwriting. <laughs> But I wanted to get some quotes out of the literature to sort of set the stage. And I think this one on page 100 is generally what we're talking about. And it says, the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. And so you hear variations on that around the program. But what is the plan? that we end up with? And that's the question. Um, when I was new, I would have, um, being self-centered, I would have assumed that I would determine what I wanted the most and God would get it for me. So God's plan for me was to have a million dollars. And when it arrived, I would thank him, and that was, would have been my answer to the test question. We're left with, well, am I going to stay miserable all my life? And so our literature is full of that also, pointing out the discomforts and the impossibility of solving the discomfort problem on our own. People that I sponsor who are having, you know, problems, um, thinking about God or whatever. Uh, probably 10 years ago, I started asking them to read the first 32 pages of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, where he, as, a, as the author, suggests to the reader that the best place to try and find God is inside of you, that you're the best laboratory to go look and since we are, that's the only thing we know for sure is that we're alive and other people say they're alive. And so he points out the dynamics that are going on inside of us. And then as we agree with him, we start seeing the point that he's trying to make. And the main point that he's making is everywhere on the planet, people are being pressured by an invisible law to behave in a certain way and to insist that other people behave in that way. And they're quick to point out to the other person, that wasn't fair what you did. And the other person doesn't argue back and say, there's no such thing as fair. They make up an excuse why it was okay for them to screw up today. They were tired whatever it is, they, they don't say there's no such thing as this unwritten rule that we're supposed to live by. They just all acknowledge that it's there. And it's very similar in each country around the world. And it exists inside of each of us. And we can't live up to it. We go through each day going, damn, I was rude to that person. I should have done this. I should have been able to do that. If I could just shut that law off, I'd have a lot more peace of mind than I do now. But on the other hand, I have to keep track of other people in case they violate it. I'd like to point it out to them <laughs> that I got on the bus ahead of you 
I had that seat. I just bent over to get a newspaper and you snuck in. This this is against the rule. This is against the thing. That you, you don't do that. You don't just take somebody's seat like that. And the other person knows that that's wrong too, but they go, well, I've got a bum knee and it's hurting me. So we make an excuse, but we never argue that there's no such thing as this unwritten set of rules that everybody keeps track of and nobody can live up to. That's the, that's the part nobody can live up to. Now that's a heck of a dilemma because you know you start out and you're young and you assume as you mature and as you get more grown up, that you'll be able to master this and you'll stop falling short of whatever this damn thing is that is there all the time. Well, I remember reading that and agreeing that, God damn, he's got a point. I just sort of kept track of three or four days and remember the feelings I would have when I fell short of something. And, um, you know, people would say, well, you're beating up on yourself. I said, no, I'm not. The law is. I would never come up with something like this and force myself to screw up all the time. I didn't put that there. Well, somebody taught it to you. No, they may have taught me a little. It was just there. It was just there. So the point of all that was to make a speculation on how that got there that if in fact there was such a thing as the creator of the universe, this creator would probably be closest to a mind than anything else, since the whole universe is so scientific. And how could this creator communicate with the creatures that he wanted to be most like him the only ones who experienced this law, all the other laws of nature can't be broken. You step off a cliff and choose not to fall, that's not gonna happen. It's just, <laughs> gravity's gonna take you down. But these laws, we have the option of breaking them and then suffering the consequences. And so, the author points out that, and, and we do the same thing in our literature. The author points out, this would cause us to think about why is this inside of me? What is it trying to tell me? It's trying to tell me that I need help if I'm ever going to be at peace with this law. I need help if I'm ever going to be at peace with myself. And we're all having a problem with being at peace with ourselves. That's the funniest thing, but you know, they have that um, very bad quality DVD of Chuck Chamberlain talking to a college crowd. It wasn't an AA talk. And it looked like the students really didn't want to be there to hear a talk on spirituality. And he probably knew that. And, and it, so he said to them, he said, the college is wonderful. It's just there's so many things they're going to teach you here. You should be so excited about being in college. But I'll tell you one thing that they can't teach you here. You will not learn it here. So they, now they're starting to pay a little bit of attention. He said, how to be at peace with yourself. And you could just see the whole room going, damn, how do you know I'm not at peace with myself? And then they started paying a little more attention to his talk because he was talking about a different level of existence, the spiritual level, which could provide solutions to this not being at peace with yourself. And so this, what C.S. Lewis was doing was setting the stage for the religion. But I think it's, it, it did a good job of setting the stage for our program and for our steps is to have this sense that there is something that's trying to tell us something and it does it by keeping us in pain 
because we can't. So there's no getting away from this. There's no way to just ignore it. Well, I'll just ignore the fact there might be a creator that's bothering me all the time. So you can drink a lot. I found that was a wonderful solution to that. It, it, I wasn't bothered with that law at all until I sobered up. And then I was doubly bothered because when you're drunk, you can really violate the hell out of everything. And um, so we come into AA, many of us with confusing ideas about God. Some of us don't want to believe in, some be believed in it didn't work, and others are praying all the time and nothing's happening. And, but it's very few new members to AEA have a very comfortable, solid relationship with a higher power, even if they're a priest. Somehow it's gotten distorted. It's gotten so that it's just not working. And alcohol became the perfect substitute. It is the, the closest thing to um, a relationship with God that there is. And even Carl Jung talked about that, that at a low level, alcoholics are seeking God by drinking. There's such a parallel because here's this power that can bring us temporarily peace of mind, a sense of fitting in, of just camaraderie, of just bringing all the things that we were unable to cause to happen to ourselves on our own, powerless. And alcohol was a wonderful higher power. It brought, it brought in tremendous uh, changes on a daily basis. I can remember the, how strong the power of alcohol was. Walking up to the bar, I started feeling better. I hadn't even had a drink yet. I'm just looking at the sign out in front, George and Harry's in New Haven, and just going, yeah, boy, it's getting better already. I'm, this is, the troubles are starting to leave. I haven't even had a drink yet. And then as I got in, and then the atmosphere and the, the whole thing, and the bartender, of course, knew your name and had your drink ready. You remember that? And you'd just go up there and go, boy, am I important. And, and then three drinks, and there wasn't any problems left. They had disappeared, like the promises say. They had slipped away. <laughs> Don't you love those verbs and the promises? That... So I started in the program trying to change my mind about all the old ideas I have about God. One of the things that caused me to change my mind in addition to the chapter of the agnostic, that's the most brilliant chapter that um, it's hard to read that and not get trapped in a box where you end up, well, maybe I'll try it. <laughs> Feels very persuasive in that chapter. He leaves you, it reminds me, of, I, I, for a little while I was running an alcohol program for a government agency. When the Hughes Act was passed, all of a sudden they said all government agencies have to have an alcohol program. And I was the lobbyist, but the Chairman knew that I could set one up or something. And the crux of it was that we, we had examiners that went into to credit unions. And I had the regional directors come in, and then I said, here's what you do. If a guy has, uh, you think he's screwing up because of his drinking, call him in, tell him you are not satisfied with his work performance and uh, that you're thinking of firing him because he's doing that bad. However, there's a new thing in the government for those people who have an illness called alcoholism where you can get a chance to go to treatment and save your job by getting sober. Or you're just a screw up who does all this crap on purpose. <laughs> so uh, w which category are you in? And it was that making an offer you can't refuse. Well, I guess maybe I am an alcoholic, you know, so. Um, the thing that convinced me more than anything was watching it happen to someone else. 
You know what I mean? Somebody who was ahead of you and they didn't believe in God and they were struggling and they were saying, Christ, one day he looked over and they, you, you go over and go, did you get promoted? Did your father leave you a million dollars? What happened to you? And they go, I had one of these transformations. And you, and you have to believe it. There's too much evidence in front of your eyes to not believe it, which is what Phil saw in Ebby. It wasn't what Ebby said, I found God. It was how he looked and the energy that was coming out of him. There was just no, and Bill said to himself, it's impossible for Ebby to look like this in pure human terms. Something big happened. And it made such an impression on him that, you know, a couple weeks later, he decided to go check out the Calvary Church mission. Of course, he stopped along the way to have a few drinks before we go check out this spiritual stuff and got in a little trouble there. <laughs> really? They were asking for volunteers to give testimony. So he went up and gave a testimony drunk. That's, uh, that's why I love AA so much. That's the type of leader I like, is to have <laughs> someone who is, I can really relate to. What did you do? Yeah, I went up and I was drunk and I gave a sworn testimony about God. And now that's cool. That's got, that's got class all over it. And so I saw these transformations. And I decided that I wanted one. I decided that that, that would be a very good thing. And I started thinking up how I could get one. I didn't look in the book for advice because that's not my style. I started thinking up how I could get one of these. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? The reason I did that is that's the first course of action that human beings take when they see a new situation, a problem, or whatever. New problem. I will figure it out. Would you call for help? No, 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 no. I will figure it out. This tendency has to be one of the biggest drawbacks to making spiritual progress that there is. The tendency to always go to the default position of I will figure it out. First, I figure it out. Then if I fail for six months or so, I might ask my sponsor one little tiny question <laughs> to give me a hint so that then I could later figure it out on my own. But the, there's just something inside of me that wants to figure it out and wants the credit for figuring it out. I, and I, I use this example when um, I wanted to stop smoking. I had about eight years. And I knew it was really bad, and I, uh, they had all these different programs and everything, and I said to myself, I'm just going to be, I'm going to use willpower, and I'm going to be mean to myself. It's going to be like Marine Corps boot camp. And when, my, when I say, oh, I need a cigarette, I go, shut up. You're not getting a cigarette. Sit down. And I knew that stopping smoking was a wonderful thing for my life, that it really was a great thing to do. But I didn't ask God's help. I did it on my own. And it probably moved me back spiritually about a 50-yard penalty because I started looking around for what else can I do on my own? There was a great sense of pride that other people had to pray. Other people used patches. Other people went to some clinic. Not me. And that desire to do it on my own just got stronger and stronger and it felt so good to finally be back in the driver's seat and we're finally, even in the middle of AA, something came along that I did by myself and I got the results and this is more like it. And it actually felt like I was working a better program than I was working before because of these great results. 
The reason I'm bringing all this up is this is why it's so hard to see God's plan. In any event, I got some other quotes just to set the stage for this, which are very similar to C.S. Lewis. We could wish to be moral. Remember these lines? We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. The needed power wasn't there. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even if we would have liked to. So you see, he's repeating the same type of language that C.S. Lewis was presenting. We got this dilemma. I got to up the ante a little bit. I've got to raise my moral performance. And if I do, I'm going to be at peace with myself. This is, I can see the, 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 the problem more clearly now. It's exactly as C.S. Lewis said. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. People have these great philosophical convictions. They have this stuff, and then they apply it to alcoholism. Boom. Fall short. Fall short. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. So we're getting to the message that we cannot make spiritual progress on our own. Now, I just, um, I see that and I go, oh yeah? Well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go visit people in the hospital for a while. Did you ever do that? I'm going to just, you know, spiritual people visit people in the hospital. <laughs> I'm going to go visit people in the hospital. So I visit people in the hospital, and I'm so proud of it, I tell everyone where I went and <laughs> who I saw. I'm, I got into hospice, and that was really wonderful, but a lot of it was this is what spiritual people do. You get over there and you're visiting the dying and you're doing all this. But it was my idea. I thought it up. And I sort of pictured myself with other hospice givers chatting around the table. And so how was your patient doing today? You know, and it was, it was nice. It really felt nice. But it was my idea. And there was a lot of pride associated with it, even though you wouldn't get me to admit it. <laughs> it was just, I'm doing this. Then I was in the Big Brother program. And um, that was more half and half. I may have been inspired, but I still recall um, doing that for about six or seven years and feeling very good that it was my idea. This idea you came up with really is paying dividends here. So it's gathering ammunition in my mental files that the best ideas come from me. That if you want good ideas, if you want a good plan for your life, Sandy, you think it up. Does anybody else have that? And they go, yeah, good, I thought it up. Here's all my goals. Here's my retirement plan. Here's this, here's that. God's not anywhere connected with it. He's got nothing to do with it. He's nowhere there. <laughs> because we like the idea of coming up with it on our own. And yet, the thing we read in the very beginning said, the things which come to us when we put ourselves in God's hands are better than anything we could have ever planned. So I'm left with, you mean... Someone could come up with a plan better than mine for me. And to me, this is the essence of what we're trying to talk about here tonight, is coming to grips with what could be better 
than the actual completion of my plan exactly as I drew it up. I wanted to marry a wonderful woman, bring up a wonderful family, have a useful job, contribute to my society, do a lot of volunteer work, and uh, die with all of the community thinking I'm a wonderful man, I never get in trouble, and all that. So if all that came true, that would probably be about as good as it could get. And uh, turns out that isn't even close. That isn't even close to what God wants us to have. So what do we think he wants us to have? Chuck Chamberlain narrowed it down. It's very simple. Conscious contact with him. Conscious contact with him. That's, in essence, is the entire plan. Doesn't sound like much of a plan, does it? Just conscious contact. Chuck said all problems are caused by conscious separation. What happens is, when we have conscious contact, we see a different world than when the contact is broken. And when it's broken, we look out and we're trying to solve what we see. When we have conscious contact, we look out and there isn't anything to be fixed. There's no need for any goals. There's no need for any planning. There's no need for anything. Everything is absolutely perfect just the way it is. Man. If everything was perfect just the way it is, there'd really be no use for me. What role would I play? You see what I mean? My ego is very disappointed with this plan. <laughs> now, that's, there's something wrong with a person who says, I don't want to be perfectly happy. I, I'd rather have something that I'm working on. And yet, this is what um, is being presented. It's almost as if we're driving a car, and the object is to get to some place as fast as you can using all the modern navigation techniques and whatever you got, these things where the satellites are talking and this and that. And you go racing down a four-lane highway, and all of a sudden it becomes a dead end. And there's a sign that says, turn around and find God. I'm trying to get to a freaking destination, man. Stuff is up with the dead ends. I'm, I know if I cut over here, I remember there's a little back alley and it'll cut back in there. I'm on the road again. Here we go. Another dead end. Turn around and find God. Jesus, I don't know when I'm going to get this freaking trip over with. And it's almost like, say, did you see any messages from God today? And, <laughs> Suggesting you try something different? No, I, I've all, there just were dead ends every goddamn place I went, and I just, it's just awful what, what, what is going on. And so I find myself so convinced that it could not be that simple. And simplicity, of course, um, that's what spirituality is, is, that's one of the essential elements of spirituality is simplicity. And Bill, in the history books, Bill came up in a letter in his later years where he described AA as an utter simplicity which encases a complete mystery. That's a lot for thinking there. It's a perfectly simple, couldn't be simpler. You come in, you get a sponsor, you follow these, whatever they tell you to do, and you get these wonderful results. And then you go, well, geez, how does that work? That is a mystery. The whole thing is a mystery. There's no way of explaining any of this. And so we're left with something that can't be explained. And peace of mind comes when that's fine and you stop trying to explain it. You stop trying to solve the mystery of God and yourself and simply enjoy it. 
you know, there's two things you can do with a mystery. You can appreciate it or you can try to figure it out. And the figure outers go crazy. And that's what the class that a lot of us fit in. We go, well, why was I an alcoholic? Remember that? That was the first year. Why was I chosen to be an alcoholic? My mother wasn't an alcoholic. There was no alcoholics there. They were little, you know, and um, finally you just go, well, I think I'll stop asking that question because no answer ever comes. And when you stop asking the question, peace of mind comes without the answer to the question. That was a big lesson that you could get a satisfactory outcome without an answer. Stop asking the question. And so I'm sure we've all done that to some extent. The other thing that has to be dealt with, this is just my own personal opinion. There's, um, I think, 6.7 billion people on planet Earth. So 6.7 billion people are alive on planet Earth. What do we know for sure about those 6.7 billion people? They're all going to die. Nobody doesn't die. Matter of fact, the biggest cause of death is birth. That's, there's, there's no, and it's the, with God, those are the two most important events, being born and dying. And so we look, you know, the prayer of St. Francis is by dying that we find eternal life. And we even have a sentence in our big book where it says we were reborn. Dying takes place when we get rid of old ideas. That person dies. They were locked into those ideas. That's who they were. They lived those ideas. And when we get rid of those ideas, that person dies and we have a new one. We're reborn. And so it's a welcomed process. It is, I mean, I just, I think back on Chuck saying one of his favorite things to be was wrong. To find out something else he was wrong about so he could get rid of it and not be carrying it around anymore even if it's something that he thought up. There's no pride of authorship. Oh, that's wrong. Bye. Now I'm free of that. That idea is now dead. And I, I, you know, whenever I tell that flying story about being in that squadron and I decided I couldn't fly anymore due to alcoholic withdrawals and everybody in there, you know, I waited three months and all I could feel was the shame and these guys looking, at well, how did that guy get in here? And finally, I got orders out of there, and I just felt so good. And then, you know, 40 years later, I meet a guy who says, did you know how popular you were in that squadron? Do you know how much it broke our hearts that you were not going to be able to fly? The colonel did everything he could. Oh, my God, it was just, and I went, that's not how I remember it. So all of that whole period of time had to die, and it was replaced with the truth. And now when I go back 42 years ago and think about that, I have a smile on my face to realize these people were so supportive and all that. It wasn't anything the way I thought it was. So it, it is uh, a tremendous advantage spiritually to some play, think about dying so that it doesn't bother you anymore. When I first got here, I couldn't visit someone in the hospital because I got panic stricken because people die in hospitals. I mean, it was a phobia. It was just awful. And my sponsor finally said, well, if I go with you, could you think you could visit? There was a guy in our home group. And I said, well, maybe, let's try it. So I went with him, and with him being alongside of me, I was able to do it, but it was still kind of terrifying. And I remember saying to him, I said, I guess someday I'll be able to do this on my own. He said, no, I'm going to always go with you. He was trying to give me an advanced lesson. See how fast it, I wanted to do it on my own? 
That was the first thought I had. I'll get rid of this bum eventually, and I'll be going in here on my own. I think the, the, the picture I have of that is that when you're new to AA, you get a bicycle with training wheels. And when you ask when the training wheels come off, we say never. <laughs> they just stay there forever. Why? Well, it'll help you from falling over. Well, I don't want to look like I need wheels after five years of sobriety. Why not? Oh, okay. Well, then I'll keep the training wheels. Now, you, that's, a, that's quite a process with the human pride. Okay, I'll keep the training wheels. So I, I guess what I'm trying to lead up to in all of this talk about God's plan for us his plan has nothing to do with anything that occurs in the material world. It matters less to him if your daughter's murdered or if you have an invention and made two million and got your own airplane. Though that's not anything to do with God's plan. It, it has nothing to do with it. If events bring you closer to God, they make you seek him, then they can serve a good purpose. What got us here? A bottom, a terrible bottom, where we hit down and we the incomprehensible demoralization, whatever it is. And it drove us here. But the jackpot was to put our hand in God's hand. That was all he wanted. He didn't want any, any of the other details have nothing to do with his plan. He just wants us to get as close as we can. And so we end up with um, things like Brother Lawrence practicing the presence. It's a book about 500 years old by a brother. He wasn't even senior enough to be a what is the next thing up? A priest or, or whatever it was. He was just uh, shine the shoes. A what? Yeah, a monk. He, was, he would shine the shoes and do the cooking in the kitchen or whatever. But he had a method of constantly being aware of God in, throughout his, the whole day. And that was what he was, in letters, helping other people, nuns and monks to, to get to the same place because they all saw that he had gone somewhere that was beyond where they were. And where it was, was constantly being aware of God's presence. And so when we look at the 11th step, we find the same thing, praying only for what about the list of prayers? No, it doesn't say that. Praying only, only, only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Praying only for his plan for us. Praying only for that. And so you can see these, uh, these other prayers, Bill had to finally cut some slack, I think, in the 12 and 12 because it upset the rest of us who wanted to pray for everything. And he said, if you add at the end of it, if it be thy will, we'll let you under the bar. But you can see the focus, no matter where you go, we're being blocked back to conscious content. You just can't, and, and we don't want to stay there. We want to come up with a different plan. I want, to, I want God's plan for, I want to play a role and what's God's plan for me is, it's me, right? I should have some say-so in what the plan is. And they're going, well, that won't work. Let's go back to this. And so there was one other quote. Let me see where it is. May have been up here. I put an asterisk on it. There it is. This is on page 75. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. 
So if I had to have a mental picture of what God's plan for us looks like, that's it. I put my hand, um, my own father, creator, and we're walking along and he's going, you think I did a good job? What do you th Look at this planet Earth. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Look at those sky. Look at all these wonderful people. Isn't this the greatest place to live? Is, is this amazing? And um, I would sit there, stand there, walk there, whatever it is, experiencing just love and a sense of well-being, and part of me would be trying to change it. And part of you would be trying to change it. And that's the struggle that we have in staying in touch with what God's plan for us is. It is, it is eternal struggle. It is just there. And so therefore, we have to accept that this is the way it's going to be, that we're going to be connected and then disconnected, and then connected and disconnected, and that that's satisfactory. Oh, I left out two things. I, I, I actually have some time left. Um, and that is step six and seven. Now, here, we're to, here we are. We're right here. We're going to get rid of the things that are separating us from God. We cannot make one ounce of progress on our own. We're entirely ready to have God remove them. Well, God will remove the ones that I can't get rid of myself. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't, it doesn't say anywhere. And then there's another sentence. <clears throat> God will help me with the things that I can't do myself. He'll also help you with the things you can do yourself so that you're always with him. See, we're constantly coming up with, let's leave God out. I can handle this without God. So let's come up with a saying God will help you with the things, implying that he wouldn't help you with the things you can do yourself. Well, if he's helping you while you're doing those things you can do yourself, you're going to be a lot happier. It's going to be a lot more fun, whatever it is. And so <clears throat> I just, I've been I'm thinking about this talk, and I'm just constantly finding ideas in my own head to leave God out. I mean, you talk about a creative mind. You just, okay, that's great. I realize God can get rid of it. I'm going to humbly ask him to remove. But some of these, I know I can make progress on my own. I can do. And uh, so in the seventh step, he talks about we tend to settle for as much perfection as will get us by. And the, that being the amount that I can do on my own. I can hold back. I can become much less angry than I used to be. And I've, I've actually had people say, gee, you're a lot less angry than you used to be. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you noticed. <laughs> yeah, you're more patient. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I sat down and I said, I'm very impatient and I'm going to do something about it. That's the first line that comes there. That's, where is that in the step? And I'm going to do something about it. It says, we're entirely ready to have God remove anger. We're entirely ready to have, and I, um, that's why I built up the ante in the 12 and 12. He went from progress, not perfection, to progress towards perfection. Remember, did you notice that? He kicked it up one notch. He said, we have to raise our eyes towards perfection. Not that I can get there, but I could be held in it temporarily. I could experience this ecstasy of turning it over completely, of just that sense that there isn't anything that I have to change. Nothing has to be changed. It's a tremendous feeling. And so six and seven are just huge examples of what God's plan is. It's almost like he wants to do all the work. 
He wants to take care of you. He wants to do everything for you. That's why one of the biggest action verbs in AA is letting go. If somebody said to you, what's the biggest action verb? It's hard to come up with letting go. Yeah, here we go. Big action. Boom. Do you know how hard it is to let go of your own life? Let go of the decisions, let go of the goals, let go of all those. That is why it's such a challenge. But God's plan for us is to let go and let him bring us whatever he has in store for us. And, you know, Bill was very interested in the afterlife. I'm, I'm just going into a little history thing. Back then, they used to have seances. Those were big deals. It would, people would come over, and the dead would talk, and Ouija boards would move around, and all of this. And so he was so sure that there, you just automatically went to the next level of life that he wanted to get involved in spreading the word all around the planet Earth that there was. And uh, fortunately, AA toned him down because it would have gone into the New York office asking questions about the afterlife. And I don't think the staff there was qualified to answer him. And so they talked him out of that. But I've always felt that as you work these steps and you experience this next level of existence, it gives you the greatest comfort about your own place in the universe and that you, I tell people this, I'm, and I'm really not joking, but part of me can hardly wait to get the hell out of here. I thought I was going down in Texas you know, with you guys. I passed out and I said, oh boy, and it was very peaceful and my heart was stopping. And the thing that made it so powerful was I was interrupting a trustee with all the ambulances and all the stuff that were coming. And I thought, what a legend to leave in AA. <laughs> the trustee never got to finish his talk. I mean, how good can, can it get? OK, I'm at the end of the time. And I hope that um, this rambling eventually comes back constantly to letting go. And, and, and to stop planning and figuring out what you need. It, it's already here. And concentrate only on this practicing the presence. That's all I got, and thank you all very much. <laughs> 10 minutes early, George. <laughs> <laughs>